Welcome to Means and Methods. I'm Kathy Parker from the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University Libraries, and we're talking with faculty about their work in scholarship and creativity, things that they investigate outside of the classroom. And with me today is Dr. Troy Knight, who's from the Environmental Studies Department here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Troy, welcome. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about what you're researching. Sure. Uh, my training is in primarily in dendrochronology, and I, I study uh, past climate primarily using tree rings. At, at its foundation, it's really, really simple. Um, the, the work that I do is based on ring width, just the width of the tree ring year after year after year and how that changes over time. Mm -hmm. um, and and at its, its, its simplest, uh, for trees that are growing in places where their growth is primarily, limit, primarily limited by, by climate, some aspect of climate, such as the amount of rain that falls, how warm it is during the growing season, the length of the growing season. Uh, folks have found, and I've certainly seen in my own research, that the width of those rings is highly correlated to the amount of rain that fell, the length of the growing season, one of these climatological factors. I've worked with, with living trees and, and uh, sub-fossil trees. So these are trees that they have not been fossilized. It's still wood, uh, but they died at some point in the past, and their wood is preserved somewhere in, on, on the ground or mm -hmm. as a standing snag. Um, you can take samples from those and, and derive dates from those ring widths as well and, and look at, extend your records further back in time. Mm -hmm. I think probably the most exciting uh, thing that I found in my own work uh, is how long these records can, can be built back in time. Um, I, in my uh, dissertation research, uh, I coupled together uh, living trees and, and sub, the subfossil wood I was mentioning before uh, into very long records of, of past climate going back over 2,000 years. Um, and so in certain parts of, of the West where it's cold and it's dry, but it's wet enough, just, just wet enough for trees to grow, mm -hmm. uh, when those trees die, the decay rates are extremely slow, and so that wood will be preserved for a, a very long time. First of all, under, understanding climate change is a, something that's extremely important uh, mm -hmm. for society today, and, and past records um, give us an indication of how climate has changed in the past without human interference. Mm -hmm. uh, they also give us um, ideas about, well, if climate is changing going forward, what is it changing from? What is the, the long-term record of climate? You know, when we look at, uh, you watch the, the evening news or you look at the weather forecast online and they talk about how uh, above or below normal the temperature is going to be tomorrow, that's based on the last 30 years. We don't have a whole lot of context if we just look at the weather station record. Uh, so the tree ring record then provides that deeper time context for what we're seeing in the weather station record today. And, and tree rings also provide this, this high-resolution record of, of climate. It, these trees put on a ring every year. So you're able to, to build um, estimates of the amount of rain that fell in each individual year. Uh, so that, that kind of resolution lends itself very well to looking at how people were adapting to climate over, over time. And as we go forward with climate change today, we're going to have to adapt as well. And so there, I think there are things we can learn from past societies and how they dealt with these problems. So uh, I love field work, and that's, that's, I, I just, I love being out in the field, that's what drew me to this, this work. Uh, unfortunately, the, the ratio of field work to lab work is, is pretty low. Um, in a couple weeks, we can collect enough samples that can keep you busy in the lab for a year. Um, so I enjoy the lab work, it's, it's, it's rewarding, um, but it, it can be very tedious tedious work. It's a lot of time spent on a microscope looking at tree rings, counting to 10 over and over and over. So uh, in any case, um, the, the field work part of it, at least for the, the work that I've been uh, working on the past few years, um, is every summer we'll take a, a week or two, travel to the study area, um, go to different locations around the study area, and look for old trees and, and old wood. And in some ways it's a bit of a treasure hunt. Um, the idea with the research I've, I've been working on is to extend those climat climatic records as far back in time as, as the trees will allow us. Uh, and of course, to do that, you've got to find the oldest trees on the landscape. Mm -hmm. To do that, you've got to find uh, places on the landscape where remnant wood, that subfossil root, wood, is well preserved. So after that processing, uh, there's uh, um, the dating of, of those rings. So every ring has to be dated to the exact year in which it formed. 
And like I just mentioned kind of jokingly a minute ago, a lot of that involves counting. Mm -hmm. um, but counting will only, if you start counting from, from bark to the interior of the tree, uh, you're, you're going to end up with wrong dates very, very quickly. Um, what you have to do is take samples, take samples from a number of trees and identify the pattern of wide and narrow rings that all those trees have in common. And then as you start counting back in time, you look for that pattern. And that pattern tells you whether you're right or, or wrong, whether you have the right date or the wrong date for a particular year. So, so to get back 2,000 years in those chronologies I was talking about before, um, you might have a live tree that lived 500 years that overlaps with a dead tree that died 250 years ago that lived 500 years, and then so on and so forth to get back that 2,000 years. So it's, it's really unusual actually to find a tree that's 2,000 years old. Um, and, and in my work, the oldest trees that I've, I've come across are just over 1,000 years. So, night owl or early bird? Early bird. Early bird, good. Um, and you're doing your work on a computer or with paper and pencil? The, the lab work is both paper and pencil and computer. So a little so bit of I've each. A little bit of everything. Mix it all up. And when you're looking for other scholarly resources, um, e-books or print books? Print books. Print books. However, with my research, most of it's journal articles. And those would be, I bet, primarily digital, right? Correct. Yeah. Although I, I print them down. <laughs> okay. So a real strong affinity for print. Absolutely. Um, you, when you get down to writing your research reports, your articles, um, you work at home or in your office in the on office. campus, on the office, and um, you fuel up with coffee or water. Coffee. Coffee, man. And last question: When you read for fun, fiction or nonfiction? Both. Oh, a man after my own heart. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you for joining us today, you Dr. Bet, Knight, yeah. and thank you for joining us as well. And check in for more um, issues of means and methods to learn about how our scholars do their work here at St. Benson's.